All right. Good morning, everyone. Phil Gallier of Thraben U here for a different sort of stream. Um, normally, I'm playing Legacy on this channel, but there is a lot going on in Legacy right now. There is a lot of innovation and testing, and the new set is incredibly pushed. And as such, Legacy is undergoing some very drastic changes. Um, I think we've only had, like, 48 hours or so of real playtime with the Ikoria cards, um, but already we're seeing major metagame changes. So today what I want to do is look at a lot of the early deck lists that people have been playing, talk about some of the cool interactions, and just sort of give you ideas for things that you can jump into the queue with and try on your own. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, power creep is very evident in this, uh, this set, that's, that's for sure. Um, so the three cards that are having the biggest impact right now are Garuda, Doom of Depths, uh, Zerda of the Waking Dawn, or something like that, and then Luris of the, the Dream Den. Where's my Bomberman deck so I can actually check that second card's name? Dawn Waker, Zerda the Dawn Waker. Um, so today we're going to go ahead and look at decks that are focusing around those, but we're going to see a lot of other cards coming into play as well. Um, I have about 15 or so different deck lists that I'm going to pull up over the course of this stream. I'm not going to claim that this stream is going to be done in the most organized way, because basically every time I saw a screen cap of something that I liked on Twitter or something, I just threw it into a folder or threw it directly into Magic Online. Um, so I might end up doubling up a little bit. Um, I might not do this in quite as organized of a way as I often do with these lecture type things, but I want to get content out there. Um, so I didn't want to spend another two or three hours organizing all of this. Um, I just wanted to like push it out this morning so that people can um, like play some of these deck lists over the weekend. All right, um, with that being said, let's start by talking about some Garuda decks. Um, I believe I have two Garuda decks that I want to talk about, yes. Okay, um, so Garuda deck number one that I currently have up on stream um, is what people are calling like Garuda Stompy or Garuda Belcher. So if you're not familiar with Gairuda, in order to play with it as your companion, your starting deck can only have even converted mana costs. And as a reminder, zero is considered even. So when this ETB, each player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, and then you put a creature card with an even converted mana cost from among those cards onto the battlefield under your control. Um, let's talk about a couple of ruling things real quick before we move forward. Um, these are things that are obvious if you read the card carefully, but are very easy to miss if you're just skimming it. So, number one. This says each player does this. So, you can take something that your opponent mills. Um, and this is somewhat common when they whiff on a creature. Which they don't usually do, but sometimes happens. So... Number two, it says, put a creature with an even converted mana cost from among those cards onto the battlefield under your control. So something like Rest in Peace or Leyline of the Void does not stop this. This does not care that the cards are in the graveyard when this ability finishes resolving. Uh, so I definitely made a mistake in one of my leagues pretty early on playing against this card, uh, where I thought Rest in Peace was going to stop the ability. I was very, very, very wrong. So, whenever one of these Gairuda enters, you have eight potential hits. Four from your own library, which are usually going to be better, and four from your opponent's library. Uh, so, there are going to be times where you play this and you just get a Thought Not Seer, or you just get a Thalia, or something of that nature. 
you can even get something real big and dumb, like say you're playing against like an Eldrazi or Post deck or, or something like that. You can potentially hit something very, very large off of Gutteruda. So this Gyruda Stompy deck aims to clone Gyruda. And some of these clones are going to be better than others because they actually let you create a non-legendary copy of Gyruda. So, for example, Sakashima the Imposter here has you create one that has a different name. So you get to keep it around. And then, is it Spark Double? Yeah, it's Spark Double that is the clone that creates a non-legendary copy. So once you've created a non-legendary copy with Spark Double, you can continue to copy it with your other clones and just create more and more and more copies of Gyruda. So oftentimes the Gyruda Stompy deck or Gyruda Belcher deck ends up just creating four or five Gyrudas and passing the turn. And let me tell you, when you create four or five six sixes on turn two, it, it tends to work out pretty well for you, uh, you know. Outside of something like Terminus that can sweep them all away very quickly, uh, you, you kill your opponent. But most of the time, <clears throat> you don't need to pass the turn. Dragonlord Culligan is a flying in haste, and other creatures you control have haste. So, let's say you hit a Gyruda, a Spark Double, and a Dragon Lord Culligan, and then you whiff. You are attacking for 18 and passing the turn with something that says, whenever an opponent casts a creature or planeswalker spell with the same name as a card in their graveyard, that player loses 10 life. Oh, that's that's pretty good. Um, but most of the time, the in my experience, when the Gyruda Stompy deck goes off, and it does so pretty quickly, um, it will probably kill you by turn three if you don't meaningfully interact with them. Not all of the Gyruda Stompy decks look like this. Uh, Grim Monolith is very common as an inclusion in this deck because it helps to power out the Gyrudas even quicker than what you're normally doing. Um, so a lot of the decks that I really like have uh, the Monolith in it. Because you can just go like, turn one soul land monolith, turn two blue producing land petal, go. Uh, if you're trying to fight against these Gyruda Stompy decks, the hardest thing for them to do is actually create the blue blue or black black for their uh, big demon to actually initially come into play. Uh, Null Rod is also very good at preventing them from casting this thing. We haven't even gotten to the most broken things yet. Um, and actually, this is pretty broken. Uh, Sci-Fi Emperor, thank you very much for your continued support. Uh, very much appreciated. I hope you enjoyed today. Um, let's look at a slightly different take at Gyruda now. Um, I'm going to try to remember where all these deck lists came from, but over the course of this week, I've just been like, copying and pasting things all over the place, um, so my record keeping isn't always the best. Uh, this one, I believe, is from Joseph Dyer of the MTG Goldfish This Week in Legacy um, series slash column. Um, he has a whole bunch of really good deck lists, uh, some of which I have already. In his two-part series, uh, This Week in Legacy, here there'd be Monsters Part 1 and Part 2, uh, which sort of were pushed out over about the last two weeks. Highly recommend them if you haven't seen them already, uh, and I'm going to throw the link to Part 1 in the chat here, um, just in case you want to bookmark that for a little bit later. Alright, let's make this a little bigger. Too big? There we go. Okay, um, deck list number two is courtesy of PVDH, who sent me a lot of deck lists. And all of PVDH's deck lists are available on his Twitter. Um, highly recommend that if you are looking for a source for uh, various deck lists. 
And this is an iteration of Gyruda Bomberman. So Gyruda's cost is that you can only play even cards. So while Bomberman doesn't lose out on a lot by doing that, it does lose out on Monastery Mentor, which was one of the secondary win conditions of the deck. And that's something to keep in mind. Uh, that is a relatively large loss. So the idea here is that Gyruda gives you a little bit of extra redundancy, uh, which is kind of cool. And you don't lose too much by playing it. Um, I don't know that this is actually one of the more broken things that you can be doing with Gyruda. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind. Any deck that has Lion's Eye Diamond plus Garuda is pretty strong. Uh, and that's something I didn't super talk about um, when talking about this. The LEDs might have looked a little bit out of place, but LED is just three mana towards Gyruda. Um, and that's 100% what you should think about this in this list. It requires no setup, so it's not like Infernal Tutor where like you're using LED to go and like get rid of the rest of your hand, and that's super important. The uh, LED is just Black Lotus for Gyruda in this deck. So another way to just make a turn to Gyruda is just Soul Land Land Black Lotus. And and you get there as well doing that. Not that one, this one? Not this one, this one? This one. Um, okay, so the Gyruda Bomberman list is something that I find interesting. But I think it's just worse than the other Bomberman list, um, which I suppose we can look at next. Um, so th this was something that caught my eye, but I don't think it's necessarily great. Uh, one cool thing that this deck does is note that Gyruda's cost is based around your starting deck. Um, so you can still have odd things in your sideboard. So super relevantly, for this deck list. You can still have the Ensnaring Wish in the sideboard as a Karn target and play Garuda as a companion. Uh, so there are some ways to kind of dance around the uh, whole companion restriction. Um, Hellclan, I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, but um, No Rod is currently my highest recommended sideboard card in Legacy. Uh, it's very good right now. So, like, your Null Rods, your Collector Oofs, your Stony Silences, get them in your deck lists. Keep this uh, degenerate stuff in check. Uh, okay, I think I have two different Fox Bomberman deck lists now. Let's see. Maybe I should create a separate folder here uh, for Disgust. That way I can move deck lists out once I've talked about them. All right, so Bomberman out. Fox Mystic Forge? Yeah, okay. Fox Mystic Forge. Yeah, okay. Well, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, at Mangaralock, or wait, no, I'm at Thraben U now, right? I think I changed that. Hold up. Yeah, at Thraben U now. Um, Null Rod, Stilny Silence. Uh, suppression field collector oof. Those are those are cards you should really be thinking about playing in Legacy right now. Okay, let's go to this window and make this bigger. Okay, um, the Boros Reckoner is a Zerda stand-in because this uh, deck list was put together before uh, Zerda was on Magic Online. So if you're not familiar with Zerda. I should just probably pull it up on a different window. All right, Zerda the Dawn Waker. In order to use it as a companion, each permanent in your starting deck has to have an activated ability. Um, so most lands do have activated abilities in that they tap to produce mana, but note that some lands such as Vesuva actually do not have activated abilities. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. All right. So Zerda the Dawn Waker says, abilities you activate that aren't mana abilities cost two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana cost to less than one mana. 
It also has a line of text that says one tap target creature can't block this turn. Um, that's not why we're playing this card. The idea with Zerda is that you create infinite colorless mana using Grim Monolith or Basalt Monolith, which also with, with blah, 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 which both have activated abilities that reduce its cost to less mana than what the thing actually produces. So this costs three to tap, or sorry, this produces three when you tap it, but costs two to untap. Similarly, this produces three, but costs one to untap. So idea number one is that you use Zerda in a Bomberman style deck. Uh, so this deck list has both Bomberman, or sorry, it has like Bomberman, Karns, Mystic Forge all shoved together into one deck list, as well as Ugin. The idea being you use your infinite colorless mana to either walking Ballista your opponent to death, churn through your deck with Mystic Forge and do something, Create one of the Karns or an Ugin and close out the game. You know, infinite mana plus Karn the Great Creator means that you have Mycosynth Lattice online immediately. Um, you know, Ugin is relatively powerful. Uh, you know, very... Oh, right, I can't zoom in on this one because this is a screenshot. Uh, Ugin's a pretty powerful magic card to ramp out early. And the cool thing about this is that even when you don't just combo off and create infinite mana, like, just playing these monoliths and keys so that you can untap them into big, dumb stuff works pretty well. And if you don't combo off via Zerda, you still have the traditional Oriox Salvager's Lion's Eye Diamond way of making infinite mana. So you have Zerda plus monolith for infinite. You have Oriox Salvager's plus LED for infinite. You have LED to cast your companion to help you go infinite. And then you have Manifold Key plus Grim Orb Assault monolith to create a lot of mana relatively quickly. Uh, so this is a powerful shell. And here's a slightly different take on the same thing. Um, let's just rearrange this to make it more viewer friendly here. Yeah, I think Ugin is one of the weaker things in the deck as well. <coughs> okay, um, this deck list came to me courtesy of XJ Cloud, who has been championing Bomberman off and on for quite some time. And I know he picked up at least one 5-0 with this. And similarly, I know a lot of other people who have been starting to play Bomberman built around Zerda. Uh, so this is very similar to the last deck list that was presented uh, with a couple of key changes. The biggest change between this one and the previous one is that Cavern of Souls is here now because creating either a an uncounterable commander, not commander, companion, they're definitely different, totally different guys, don't get them confused. Uh, creating an uncounterable companion so that you can go off is strong and sim similarly, uh, Uncounterable Oriox Salvagers, so you can go off that way, uh, is also relatively powerful. So this version is slightly better at playing around counter spells. Uh, notice, kind of like we saw before, that you have the ability to get something that is uh, an odd converted mana cost out of the sideboard um, with Karn. Uh, oh, sorry, that doesn't matter here. This is a Zerda deck, not a Gyruda deck. Uh, ignore that part. I'm being silly. Um, I think this version's pretty strong. Um, there's a couple of things that I like about it in particular. Um, I do nothing a lot. So, is this deck worried about Wasteland? Yes. Is this deck worried about Collector Oof and Null Rod and Stony Silence? Yes. Does this deck do anything about that? Eh? Probably not, right? So, like, there's some things that you can play around, and there's some things that you can't. And if you want to be this artifact-based, fast mana, uncounterable threat deck, you have to make some concessions to something. And, like, currently this deck really doesn't do a very good job of beating Nullrod, and it doesn't particularly do a good job of playing around Wasteland. You get some fast mana in LED monoliths opal so that like 
sometimes it's not going to be attractive to Wasteland you, and that's kind of how the deck has to play around Wasteland, is by like leaning into it and also playing fast mana to try to get ahead of your opponent so that Wastelanding you is something that might be bad for them, because they might, like, let's say you go Ancient Tomb into Basalt Monolith. Can you Wasteland that Ancient Tomb? And they just then just go, like, Land Karn? That's, that's kind of how you play around Wasteland in a deck like this one. Hey, Echo, welcome. Um, so, I think Bomberman is probably the most powerful that it has ever been right now. And that's saying something, because I've been pretty high on this deck in the past. Um, it's perhaps a little annoying to click through on Magic Online. Less so than Food Chain, but, you know, still pretty annoying. So just kind of keep that in mind if you're going to be grinding with this deck. No, that was actually like a super good question. I'm, I'm uh, very glad that you asked that one. All right, so we talked about Fox Mystic Forge. Um, do I have another fox deck? I'm not sure that I do. Okay, um, let's talk about a cool one that I saw this morning on Twitter from, what is it, JKK? Oh, I don't remember. Uh, it's Jack Kendall's Twitter, JJKBB2005, JJKBB2005. Um, Jack Kendall posted a Zombardment deck list uh, built around Lurus of the Dream Den, which I really liked. Um, Zombardment is a really cool deck. Um, I think sort of the original successful version of the deck list was crafted by Sam Black for some random like SEG Open or Classic one weekend. Um, and he like spiked a, a top 8 finish or something like that or won the event. I don't remember exactly around this deck built around Goblin Bombardment and recurring things from the graveyard. And it was a super cool deck list that, like, people tried to, like, do it again, and pretty much everyone except him fell short playing this deck list. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a one-and-done deck list, and now Hogak is largely a better version of this deck list, and traditional Zombardment was largely invalidated. But Lurus really breathes some life into this archetype. So Lurus is probably the best of the, the new companions. Uh, Lurus, Zerda, and Gairuda are all very, very good. Um, but Lurus is probably the most flexible of all of those. <coughs> and so it's a 3-2 lifelinker cat nightmare. And its requirement is that each permanent in your starting deck has converted mana cost two or less. Note permanent. So you can still play things like Force of Will and Force of Negation, Lingering Souls, stuff like that, but your permanents have to be two or less. And during each one of your turns, you can cast one permanent spell with CMC two or less from your graveyard. So, Lurus gives you a way to always get back your creatures from the graveyard, and also get back things like your Goblin Bombardments, and that's really, really strong. Note, this is cast, so you don't get your lands back. Um, an interaction that is very frustrating for the fair deck players is the one between Lurus and Goblin Crater Maker. So in case you're not familiar with this gem, uh, which has seen a good amount to a good amount of legacy play, is that you can pay one to sack it and shock a creature or destroy target colorless non-land permanent. Let's see, what things that Phil loves does this destroy? Thalia, Stoneforged Mystic, Chalice, Thorn of Amethyst. Most of the things that are in the prison decks just get completely invalidated by the combination of Goblin Crater Maker and Lurus. Uh, it is absolutely brutal. Yeah, either vile too. Uh, and, and going bigger, things like Mystic Forge, a small walking ballista, a Karn, an Ugin, an Emrakul. Uh, the Lurus Goblin Crater Maker combo is very, very strong. Uh, Rob Fighting, uh, let me address that question. So the question is, isn't the appeal of Zombardment that the creatures come back already? Yes, 
but they have a condition, right? So, hey, Darkview. Uh, Blood Gas requires a land to come back. Gravecrawler requires another zombie to come back. Stitcher Supplier doesn't come back. Tide Hollow Scholar doesn't come back. Goblin Crater Maker doesn't come back. Um, Crit Breaker doesn't come back. So many, but not all, of the creatures come back. So the appeal of this deck is using Gravecrawler or Bloodcast repeatedly. But Loris makes it so that like all your crap keeps coming back. Uh, is it better than Hogak? Literally no idea. Uh, Hogak is relatively strong. It has a very fast linear combo finish while also having the ability to just go wide of a lot of decks. And this deck is attacking from a different angle. So I don't have data yet. Um, another cool thing about Luris is that you can use it to loop some hate cards. So for example, this lets you loop Tormod's Crypt every turn or Seal of Cleansing every turn. So those are very strong against these graveyard-focused decks and these artifact and enchantments-focused decks that are going around. Um, so this probably has a lot more likes than people will give it credit for. All right, uh, what's next? Let's start looking at some of the uh, the other Luris decks, I suppose. Uh, so this was an early draft of Grixis Luris Delver. Uh, no, I haven't talked about Storm yet. Or Delver. We're going to start Delver now. <laughs> All right. So... Luris is a really dumb magic card, and it's going to get slotted into a lot of things, and I think it's very powerful in Delver. So it does something really cool in Delver that Delver doesn't normally get to do, and this card lets you keep hands without threats because you always, always, always have a threat. So your hands that look like I don't know, land, 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 brainstorm, ponder, bull, force of will, or something like that. Like, that's like really lacking in anything to do early. You're just kind of spinning your wheels. Hands like that become more attractive when you have Luris because you're guaranteed to have a threat. The other thing that Luris lets you do is not defend your creatures. So if you tap out for turn turn to, like, let's say, Young Pyromancer, and your opponent goes to bolt it. Do you actually need to use your counterspell on that when you can just get it back with Luris and actually protect your Luris a little bit later on? Um, so Luris does super interesting things to the play patterns of these decks. So the one of the big questions when you're playing Grixis Delver is going to be how much black do you actually want to have in your deck? Oh yeah, Luris is very dumb in Delver. Very, very dumb in Delver. Uh, I've played against a couple Luris Delver decks that like also have Goblin Crater Makers in the sideboard, and like, holy fuck, that was frustrating. <laughs> that was just like recurring threat, recurring removal, recurring get rid of my chalices. Like, oh my gosh. Uh... It was hard to beat. Um, so when you see Luris revealed, don't think always this is going to be an unfair deck like Storm, because Luris is just as good in unfair decks as it is in fair decks. And I totally underestimated how good Luris was going to be in Delver. Like, I thought it was just going to be cute, but like, no, it's very strong. Uh, another cool thing about Luris is that, like, let's say Luris is a turn six play, all right? Like, let, let's let say, like, your primary game plan has failed, and now you're on your backup plan. How many removal spells have your has your opponent used to get to the point where you have to cast Loris? 
Uh, we're gonna talk about Sprite Dragon in a minute. So like, let's say your opponent uses three removal spells to get through like a Delver, an Arcanist, and a Young Pyromancer. Do they have another lined up to deal with that Lurus? Because if they don't, oh boy, like it's it's just another card like Arcanist that just snowballs very very quickly. Um, this was an early build, so this isn't necessarily what they look like now. Um, I'm going to show off another deck list here. All right, so that Lurus Grixis Delver is out. Um, let's look at draft two. <coughs> uh, this is one that Callum Smith sent me. Uh, this one is uh, super interesting because it is a Grixis Delver list that is playing Mishra's Bobble. And you might go, why are you playing that card? That card sucks. Well, let me tell you, after playing against... I don't know, probably about six different Mishra's Bobble Lurus decks, that card does not suck. Why would I talk about Yudara's Standstill when I can talk about Lurus Standstill? Gosh, why don't we just play the good card instead of the bad card? Uh, just aside, I did play against Lurus Standstill, um, and I had to win via timeout. Uh, Lurus recurring Porphyry Nodes, and Mishra's Bobble and Standstill was some serious shit. Uh, that match went on forever. <coughs> uh, I won, but I would not have won if not for the clock. My opponent had like an 8-8 eight, eight and 8-7 eight, uh, myth realized because of Mishra's Bobbles being recurred every turn via Lurus. Uh, it was crazy. Yeah, so Mishra's Bobble plus Lurus is super cool. So you play Lurus, you cast Mishra's Bobble immediately before your opponent has priority, and you already have a two for one. And then if someone bolts Lurus, you have a three for one. So the floor on Lurus is a three for one when you have Mishra's Bobble or when you can immediately cast something from your graveyard. And that's something that I don't think people immediately noticed when they started doing all of the theory crafting around Lurus. Uh, so the card is stupid, stupid strong. Um, there's also some other cute interactions here, like being able to repeatedly cast Kroxa from your graveyard. And this deck also has Sprite Dragon, which is just, like, mind-blowingly good. Like... How good it is, is being overshadowed by the companion cards, which are just beyond broken. But Sprite Dragon is a huge upgrade for Delver decks. Uh, that card is very powerful. Uh, when you don't have a removal spell for it, like, you might only get whacked for, like, one or two the first turn. But it's, like, two or three turns later, when there's, like, this 6-6 six, six flyer on the battlefield that you can't deal with that's now bigger than all of your stuff. It's a huge problem. Uh, yeah, and that is, like, so relevant, too, right? So, Sprite Dragon is also just blue, so it pitches to your forces. So, when you already have a threat on board and you don't need another threat, or when you're, like, low on cantrips or other cards to cast with it, like, Sprite Dragon just, like, can be... It's okay that it's one of your worst cards in those cases, because it, like, helps to protect your primary game plan, then. Uh, the card has been very good. Uh, I've been super impressed by it, um, seeing it on the other side of the table. Um, I don't want to tip my hand too much because, like, I'm brewing a deck, but Sprite Dragon gets dumb very quickly, and there are only going to be a handful of things in Legacy that can stand up and beat it. Uh, I was playing Baneslayer Angel, which has protection from dragons. Um, I'll have you know that's very relevant in this format now, as is protection from demons because of Gyruda. So just saying, um, Baneslayer Angel is good in Legacy again. Uh, you heard it here first. Um, but Sprite Dragon gets absolutely huge. Yeah, I have won games because of both protection from dragons and protection from demons in this current format with Baneslayer Angel.
All right, uh, so we talked about the second Loris Grixis Delver deck. Um, I have one more. No, I have two more Delver decks uh, for you all to look at. Um, so this one doesn't play a companion, uh, which I think you should be playing a companion if you can reasonably um, play a companion right now. But here's what Blue Red Delver might look like if you are looking to play, like, without the black cards. So, like, the advantage here is that you get some number of basics, and you have a few more direct damage spells, which are good with Sprite Dragon. Um, I think Grixis Delver is very clearly the best Delver deck right now, so I would not actually recommend playing this list. But... Like, if you enjoy the play patterns of Blue-Red Delver, like, you want a little bit more mana stability, you know, you want access to a few more blasts in the sideboard or something like that, um, this is not a bad starting point for what your deck list might need to look like. Um, I'm kind of moving past that relatively quickly because I love this deck list. Uh, this is Daniel Gottschall, Gold Ducats, uh, deck list from uh, one of the recent playoff events. And I super love this deck list. It's like the deck list that I saw previously, or that I discussed previously, but it's kind of been updated after like actually playing with the decks. So notice here that like because of Luris, there's a full playset of Mishra's Bobble here, uh, which is like super, super strong. I'm going to get to that. Um, and this one also has the sideboard Goblin Crater Makers for, like, the, the Lurus Wombo combo, as well as, like, Nihil Spellbomb, Tormod's Crypt, Engineered Explosives that you can recur. Like, holy crap, recurring Engineered Explosives with Lurus gives you outs to things you're not supposed to have outs to in Grixis colors. So, like, you get to answer things like Rest in Peace that you normally don't get to answer, and that's so good. So, like, you get Recurring Graveyard Lockout in three pieces. You get Recurring Permanent Lockout for CMC two or less. Uh, you get Destroy Any Colorless Thing. Like, this is so good. Notably, there are two Caracas in your deck, uh, and this serves a handful of purposes. Number one, it casts Luris. Number two, it protects Luris. Number three, it bounces opposing companions. So this is a Grixis Delver decklist with 20 lands, two of which are Caracas. Um, this is absolutely like madman genius deck building right here. Um, I love this decklist. Uh, and like I might like grind with some Grixis Delver, and I hate Delver decks. But, like, everything that this Delver deck is doing is so cool. Yeah, um, so, Gas Chamber hopes I'd go a step further, right? So you're a Grixis deck, so you theoretically have uh, Engineered Explosives for X equals 4 as well. So, in the off chance that someone hasn't gotten the memo and is still playing, like, Jace the Mind Sculptor or something like that, uh, you can EE for four. Um, maybe more relevantly than Jace, uh, like, Karn the Great Creator or, or something like that is, like, theori theoretically possible to EE. Uh, so, I love, love, love this deck list. Just super impressed by all the little nuances here, especially for very early on in the format. You get so much interaction against the opposing companion decks. So like for the all-in companion combo decks, you have six forces, four days, three Thoughtseize main deck to disrupt what they have going on. And then you have like the various things in the sideboard that are also going to fight against them. So like super, super impressed uh, by this deck. Um, let me scan here. Oh, I think I missed this one earlier. Yeah, I missed this one earlier. T 
too many cards. Uh, okay, do all of those fit on now? They do. <clears throat> oh, is it hard? Yes. Is it possible? Also, yes. Yeah, I Demiel, I don't know what I'm going to play in the Dealer's Choice stream. Um, like, Grixis Delver is a possibility, but I was, like, maybe leaning more towards, like, General Kudro Humans, uh, which is another deck list that I'll be talking about uh, shortly. Okay, um, here's another Zerda deck list that I forgot to talk about earlier. Uh, this one is blue-based, so it's treating Zerda like it's a white card, and this is a blue-white deck that is, like, very much an Urza Emery Stompy deck, like we've been seeing uh, recently. But it also just has, like, Zerda combo built in. So you can just use Grim Monolith and Basalt Monolith to ramp into Karn the Great Creator, or Creator, Creator and Urza. Or you can just, like, get Zerda, create infinite mana, and then, like, do shenanigans with some combination of, like, Urza, Emery, and Karn. Um, so that's super cool. Uh, this deck list has a really cool interaction that is not immediately obvious that I want to talk about. All right. So something that you might miss is that Mycosynth Lattice lets you spend mana as though it were mana of any color. So if you have Mycosynth Lattice in play and you have generated infinite mana with Grim Monolith and Basalt Monolith, you also have infinite colored mana. And if you have infinite colored mana, you can use your your like infinite colored mana to just like cast Urza and start going off. So there was a super cool Twitter puzzle that involved this interaction where like you had to win this turn for some reason. And so if you have like the, the Mycosynth Lattice in play and you generate infinite mana, you can then cast Urza and use Urza to start churning through your deck. And once you do so, you can like get Karn the Great Creator, and if something you need is, like say, in your graveyard, you can Tormod's Crypt yourself and go off. So there are these fringe scenarios where like your Walking Ballista has been countered already, where you have infinite mana, you go Urza, Urza until you find a Karn, Karn, get Tormod's Crypt, exile your graveyard, Urza until you find another Karn, Karn for Walking Ballista, kill your opponent. Uh, so there's some super cool, like, very high-level plays that uh, you can do with this deck list. Uh, yeah, I think I got paired against them, and they, uh, they beat me. Was not close. Whew. All right. What's next? Um, I mentioned humans. Let's do humans next. Oh, we're going to need to make that way bigger. Uh, apologies for inconsistency in formatting, but I was just kind of grabbing deck lists wherever I could. All right. Um, in my set review, sort of like podcast with Eternal Glory, I thought that General Kudro was going to be a pretty easy one of in humans. And then I played against the deck once and I'm like, no, it wants more than one of that card. General Kudro is super, super strong in humans. It gives you... All right, um, let me pull up this card because it might be one that many of you aren't familiar with. All right. So... Kudro is a 3-mana lord that pumps all your things out of Plague Engineer range. It itself isn't going to get killed by do double Plague Engineer. When it or another human enters the battlefield, you exile a card from an opponent's graveyard. So it's like good against reanimator type things, it's good against uh, like slow ac accumulation of things in graveyard for things like Gurmag Angler, it's good against Dreadhorde Arcanist, like it's very strong. And then you can also sacrifice two humans to destroy a target creature with power four or greater. And a lot of times the way the play patterns of the human deck works 
is in the mid to late game, you really have one or two big threats that you care about, like say a champion of the parish and like maybe a Thalia's lieutenant or something like that. And then you have these expendable bodies such as Noble Hierarch and Imperial Recruiter or Recruiter of the Guard. And when you go and slam something like this onto the battlefield, it threatens to get rid of the big thing that is stopping your giant humans from getting through while also giving so much side value. <coughs> um, it could be okay in a DNT splash black build. Um, I totally agree with that. Uh, I don't think DNT is a competitive deck right now. Um, there's so much combo online that is faster than death and taxes right now. Uh, until that chills out a little bit, uh, I don't, I don't think you want to be going Aether Vile Go. Uh, fine and Andy, I, don't, don't you worry, I've been working on the Lava Brink Venturer. Alright, do I have a, do I have a good Lava Brink Venturer screenshot I can share? I bet I do. Is it this one? Oh. Oh, sorry. That's that's just a four for one with settle the wreckage. Ignore that screenshot. Lava Brink Venture just happens to be in that one. Don't worry about that. We've been having a lot of fun in the uh, the sub Discord recently. Venture is in many of my screenshots that I have. Card's been card's been good. Not great, but good. Okay, um, so super impressed with General Kudro humans. Like, the the once upon a time in these shells make your openers stronger, and then General Kudro makes your mid to late game stronger. So, like, I, I really like deck lists uh, that look something like this. Uh, the exact numbers, I think, are going to vary a little bit as we, like, figure out where the metagame's at. So, for example, I wouldn't be surprised if the meddling mage numbers ticked up to four just because like when your opponent reveals a companion meddling mage is a free roll like you 100 percent know something that you can name and shut off and shutting off your opponent's companion is really strong um on a side note there it's very possible i'm gonna have to eat crow for something that i said All right, so I think this is a shit card. Like, I saw this previewed, and I went, this is absolutely unplayable. However, let me say that if Legacy becomes utterly dominated by companion cards, this is something that may see some degree of play. So, like, I think this card is very very bad in the pre Ikoria world. Uh, and I think the stats on this card are abysmal. But if Legacy devolves to the point where, like, every game is Gyruda Belcher, uh, Zirda Bomberman, or Luris, insert deck name, I can see this seeing play. Like, this card is very very underwhelming against everything, but it hates on companions. So that may see a non-zero amount of play. So I will I will fully admit that now after, you know, oh, I don't know. I've played a lot of leagues, like so many leagues since Ikoria came out because like I've just been super, super having fun with the format. And, like, I have something that I'm trying to break as well. So, I've gotten a lot of perspective on exactly how good these companion cards are by playing so many leagues. Um, okay, Galios, I haven't done a lot of, like, deep searches to see what else is going to stop companions. Um, but I'm sure that there are. So, Steel Stompy is another deck that 
can kind of play various companions relatively easily. Uh, yeah, let me answer this question before I start talking about Steel Snappy Decklist. I do nothing a lot. Do you feel like Legacy is now all about companions? I.e., you're not playing a deck with a companion, you're just straight up disadvantaged? The answer to that question is yes. Just full stop. Uh, I think Legacy right now is you are playing a companion or you are playing a deck list that is doing something very powerful that happens to be good against companions. I, I think that's where you need to be at. So something like, say, Eldrazi Stompy, that like is very powerful, has multiple different disruptive angles and acceleration, something like that is fine not playing a companion. But, like, Companion starts you with a virtual 8th card and a greater degree of consistency than many other things that we've currently seen. And so, right now, we're in this sort of, like, Companion arms race, and you don't want to start a step behind unless you have a fine reason to. TES plays Luris now. Luris is very good in TES. Probably better than Luris in Ant. I have I haven't seen any Eldrazi elk builds yet. Um, that's cool. Um, so Steel Stompy is a deck that can potentially like play some of these companions, like relatively speaking, for free. Um, so here's an Amori build that I'm not uh, super jazzed about because I have another build of Steel Stompy that I like more. I forgot to pull this one up. Um, so I sent Max Dorshin a question last night, and all it was was Loris Steel Stompy question mark? And then he sent me this deck list, which I'm going to try out. Uh, I'm super excited to try out this one. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with this yet from, like, other things that I've said on the stream, uh, Walking Ballista, Chalice of the Void, Stone, Kill, Stone Coil Serpent, um, Engineered Explosives, your X cost cards still work with various... Uh, like Luris abilities. So recurring like Ballista, Stone Coil, Chalice of the Void is super, super strong. Um, so I'm like really excited about this deck list. I, I think it's very good. Like the ability to play like Thalia, Thorn, Chalice ahead of schedule, backed up by like all of these like relatively annoying threats that grow, backed up by Luris is, like, something I'm super interested in. And you might go, yeah, Phil, I don't know about that one. I don't, I'm kind of skeptical. Here's, here's the screenshot I got about 10 minutes later from Max saying, I'm winning because of this, where every turn he recast Stone Coil Serpent to chump block Merit Lodge, and then recast it with Loris. Loris is good, folks. Loris is very good. Um, so that deck list was playing Loris, not Zerda. So Zerda is the one that goes infinite with the, uh, the Mana Rocks. Uh, whereas Luris is the one that lets you recast stuff from the, the graveyard. Uh, let me make sure that's on screen. So, like, this one is Luris. Uh, so I'm excited about, like, Luris Steel Stompy. Uh, lot, lots of new names from the set that matter. <coughs> Sorry, I, I have this, like, really long document that I've been keeping off to the side of all the various ideas that I have uh, as I have them. So every once in a while you're going to see me uh, just kind of jot something down quietly. I mean, I'm super excited about it as of right now, but uh, yeah, these cards are good. These cards are real good. All right.
Um, I think we're going to get into some of the, like the, the fringe weird stuff now. I just want to confirm that I've gone over all of the things that I want to go over. Uh, you all don't get to see Search Stompy yet. I'm going public with that list when, like, once I get a 5-0 with it. But, like, I want to make sure that, like, either me or someone from the Discord channel 5 is with it before um, I go public with it. Um, I will show off one of the, the reject builds, though. Um, I think Soldier Stompy can get a little bit of life breathed into it with Lava Brink Venturer. Um, Lava Brink Venturer is a super cool card. So when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose even or odd. And it gets protection from each one of those converted mana costs. So a lot of times, Lava Brink Venturer ends up being a true name nemesis that you can play on turn one. So any hand where you have a Soul Land and a Chrome Mox, you can play your turn one true name nemesis. Which is pretty darn annoying. And it's a very strong turn two play as well. Uh, so I'm very interested to see if something like Soldier Stompy could be um, revitalized. I'm not going to claim that it is going to be anywhere near tier one, because it is probably not with the power level of like things that we're seeing. But like it definitely could be a like viable, like, low end of tier 2 deck list, depending on how things end up shaping out. The problem is right now that Legacy is hyper fast, and Soldier Stompy is something that traditionally does well in the late game, because you have, like, this, like, either Palace Jailer or Enlistment Officer set of inevitability versus the slow, dirtily decks. Uh, is it always odd? No, actually. Uh, it very frequently ends up being even. The reason is because you put Chalice on one, and then with Lava Brink Venturer on even, protection from one and two covers most of Legacy's removal spells. And the one thing it doesn't stop there that's super notable is Oko. Like, there are, there are other things, but uh, that's kind of one of the things that I've noticed in testing thus far. Yeah, uh, super happy with not playing against Oko every round. Uh, that's that's for sure. And obviously the 15 islands in the sideboard means that I was brewing up a whole bunch of different deck lists and didn't bother to make sideboards for all of them. Alright, um, let's start going into some of the more fringy deck lists. Uh, so, Yorian is a card that I don't think is legacy playable, but some people are still going to try. Yorian's cost is that you have to be playing 80 or more cards in your deck. And I think that reducing the consistency of your legacy deck list is a little bit questionable. Without going into the math side of the equation, and uh, Max Dorshan posted a couple of really good things on Twitter about like the math of why playing a Yorian deck is a really bad idea. Um, without going into the math side of things, I, I think like opting to make this choice to get a free 4-5 four fl four flyer that blinks is a little bit questionable. Um, but I get the appeal. This is the same sort of appeal that like Battle of Wits has, right? Where like you're you're going, like, real hard down the jank rabbit hole to see what cool things you can do. And, admittedly, it can do some cool things. So I've seen a couple other Yorian deck lists floating around that are, like, eight Strix deck lists, where it's, like, four Ice Fangs, four Baleful Strix, four Uros, uh, two or three Snapcasters, and you're just trying to, like, go real hard on the, if I cast this Yorian, I get an absurd amount of value game plan. Uh, which is, which is cool. Well, in Legacy, you have to worry about dying on turn one a decent amount. And if you have an 80-card deck, the chances of you, like, having some of your early interaction is, like significantly lower and like having the right card at the right time in legacy is super important and so like decreasing the amount of time that you hit your sideboard cards is super sketch and like i, I don't want to talk about the math like i don't want to go there but 
when you're playing an 80 card deck, you're also going to run into more times where you hit like too many lands or too many non lands uh, more frequently than you would in a normal deck. So even though the ratios are the same, the chances of you hitting like pockets of things goes up slightly, well, probably significantly when you start playing larger decks. And I think even if you do some things to try to combat that, like even if you go up to like, you know, eight forces, more thought sees, that sort of things, um, I think you're going to run into more situations where you're just drawing the wrong stuff at the wrong time. Yeah, but I think Modern's power level as a whole is much lower, so like it's more forgiving. Okay. So, one of the, the next things that I've seen is random deck lists that have this elemental elk thrown in. Uh, Gigantha the Wellspring. So, this has text on it, but you should largely ignore the text. This is a 5-5 five five that you can play as your uh, commander friend. Oh, your companion. Oh, geez, they're not commanders. They're totally not commanders. Oh, no, that's that's just a dirty word. <laughs> okay, uh, so you can play this as your companion as long as your starting deck has... Sorry, I should rephrase that. As long as no card in your starting deck has more than one of the same symbol in its mana cost. So you don't get any, like, green, green, white, white, or XX cards. So, sometimes this is going to be free. Uh, I think it is a mistake to play this in Eldrazi, right? Chalice of the Void is an XX card, so you can't play this in Eldrazi unless you drop Chalice, which seems dumb, because Chalice is, like, a great card. Um, I didn't know people were trying that, um, but, you know, good for them. So, the text on this card is that you get to tap for Wooburg, but it can't be used to pay generic mana costs. So you can't use it for colorless stuff, you have to use it for colored things. So, like, by the time you get to 5 mana, you don't need this. So, this is just a free 5-5 five, five threat that you get to cast at some point in the game. Like, some people are getting cute and saying, like, oh, I will build uh, vile elementals or slivers that use this card. Um, and, like, just thinking about a legacy board state, if you get the opportunity to attack with a 5-5 five, five and you don't attack with a 5-5, five, five, something has gone horribly wrong, right? Um, so, I don't know about like, whether or not this elk is, like, truly legacy playable, and my guess is that the answer is closer to no than yes. But it's something that, like, should be on your radar. And I have relatively high opinions of Maverick sideboard slots. Like, I think Maverick gets to play so many good sideboard cards uh, you know, there's there's Collector Oof, there's Additional Removal, Veil of Summer, Choke, uh, Carpet of Flowers, Deafening Silence, um, sometimes things like additional copies of, of Questing Beast, Shifting Ceratops, like there's all sorts of cool things that you can be slotting into the sideboard slots of Maverick, and losing a sideboard slot is, I think, huge. So, like, you know, another thing that's commonly in your sideboard is Silver Bullets for Knight of the Reliquary to tutor up, and, like, Losing a slot to get a 5-5 five five consistently may or may not be better than just having one sideboard card in your, like, Green Sun Zenith toolbox deck slash Knight of the Reliquary toolbox deck. Okay, yeah. Yeah, shift, yeah Shifting Ceratops, um, Palace Jailer are examples of things that you can't play with Gigant of the Wellspring. And Questing Beast is insane. Uh, that card gets you out of a lot of really weird spots. Alright. 
Uh, I'm going to take 30 seconds and run to the restroom while you all eye this deck list. I'll be right back. All right, sorry about the delay there, folks, but I've been going through a lot of water because I am talking a lot. Okay, um, so the next thing to talk about is uh, the loot tree decks. So uh, let me pull up a bigger version of this one because this is one that we haven't talked about. Uh, so it is loot tree the spell chaser. It is a companion card that says each non-land card in your starting deck has a different name. So it's a 3-2 flash. When it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control, you can choose new targets for that copy. Uh, so this is the otter that got itself banned in EDH slash commander before it actually came out, uh, because it would just be so powerful there. A couple times previously on this stream, we have played with Tainted Pact decks. Um, and we did, like, surprisingly well with them, and they were a lot of fun. Uh, so Lutri definitely slots into that sort of deck list, where you play a lot of slightly different overlapping situational cards. So instead of, like, say, playing a playset of Thoughtseize, you get, like, an Inquisition, a Thoughtseize. Uh, instead of playing a whole bunch of, like, actual counterspell or dazes or something, you get like a pierce, a snare, a veil, a counterspell. So you end up with a decent degree of redundancy, even though you don't have additional copies of the card. I think Lutri decks are not going to be good, but I think they will be very fun. Like if you are if you are looking to dick around for an evening and just like play something that you're gonna get laughs from, this is this is going to be like A plus material right here. Um, but I don't know that I want to put all my eggs in the basket of this otter when, like, it's relatively fragile and also requires a decent amount of mana investment to be good. Uh, but, you know, you can try it. It's a, it's a, it's a fun, fun brew. It's literally all fun of, so... That is what it is. Um, when we're talking about going deep, um, this one is pretty deep. Uh, this is an Obosh Burn deck list. Obosh the Prey Piercer. All right. So your starting deck contains only cards with odd converted mana costs. Uh, so this is kind of the opposite of Gairuda. And it says, if a source you control with an odd converted mana cost would deal damage to a player or permanent, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. So this turns all of your bolts into six mana damage spells. Yes, uh, it is definitely of the hum variety, until you realize what you miss by playing this. You miss out on Eidolon of the Great Rebel by playing this card. And I don't know if you know what that card does, but it's like Burn's best way of dealing with combo. You lose out on Price of Progress, which is your best way of mising wins against greedy decks. 
and you lose out on Fire Blast, which is really good with Monastery Swift Spear, and is also just your best, like, mana investment to damage ratio card. If things are going well in Burn, your opponent should be dead before you get to 5 mana. So I don't really like this. This is something that might be more appropriate on like a modern power level. I don't know like what modern burn looks like, but like I could theoretically potentially see it there, but even then, I don't know. But this is one of those ideas that like I'm going to be aware of this. Because if you see someone reveal an Obosh, like this is probably what it means. No in modern burn? Okay. I don't, I don't know, like, what degree of efficiency they have there. Oh, Luris is in Modern Burn. Yeah, that makes more sense. Luris is dumb. Why not play the dumb card? Yeah, play... When in doubt, play the play the stronger companion. Alright. So, next up uh, is a Song of Creation storm list. Uh, I think this was an Orm list. I don't remember where I saw this one. Uh, the card that is clipped off here is Echo of Eons, by the way. So the idea is that you go and power out Song of Creation, which says you can play an additional land each turn. Whenever you cast a spell, you draw two cards, and you discard your hand at the end of turn. So the idea is that you go like Lotus Petal, draw two. LED, draw two. Uh... Sack the LED, cast Echo of Eons, you know, get a fresh seven, use all those cards to go and, like, draw a whole bunch of cards and eventually grape shot your opponent out. I think it's bad, but I like it. Uh, agreed. I don't think there is going to be a competitive Song of Creation legacy deck. I think you're, like, trying to jump through too many hoops. I think Song of Creation just gets, like, Pyroblast or Dazed, and it's, like, super, super feel bad. Uh, but, you know, it's a cool idea, right? And that's kind of all that I have to say about that. Okay, um, the next deck list here is one that I theorycrafted from the, like, the, the first moment that I saw Mothra, and that's like somebody else actually posted. And that's the idea of using, like, Mothra to combo with Solemnity. Sorry, the, the card technically has a name, Luminous Brood Moth. Uh, let's pull that up for full size for you. Let's use a Scryfall one that's bigger. All right. So Luminous Brood Moth is a 3-4 flyer. Whenever a creature you control without flying dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a flying counter. So the idea is that if you have Solemnity in play, it stops the creature from getting a counter, and then you get to go infinite. So if you have some creature that sacks itself, plus Solemnity, plus Mothra, you get to go infinite. So for example, Mog Fanatic will let you deal one damage to something infinitely. And one damage to your opponent's face 20 times usually gets them dead. Sometimes you have to do 22, maybe even 23 if you've sorted the plowshared something. Um, but, you know, it, it gets the job done. Excuse me for a second here. How well does Mothra fit into DNT? It probably doesn't, but I'll probably record with it anyway just to, like, prove that it doesn't. Um, I think it's potentially better in Maverick where you can play it out earlier, uh, but even then it's questionable because at the 4 mana slot it's competing with like Palace Jailer, Shifting Ceratops, Questing Beast. So like the 4 mana cards there are still really good, but like Flying Knight of the Reliquary that comes back is like pretty cool as well. And so if you want to try some deck like this, the other thing that you can do is Solemnity Dark Depths. So Solemnity keeps the ice counters from being put on Dark Depths and gives you another way to go and produce a Merit Large. Merit Lodge, not Merit Large. Although he is definitely Merit Lodge. Merit Large as well. 
Okay, um, that is the set of deck lists that I wanted to talk about. Now, there are totally other things floating around online that I did not discuss. But these are kind of the things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, the format is super, super interesting, and there's a whole bunch of really cool new things to explore. Some fair things, a lot of mostly unfair things. And there's also just a handful of other innovation going on right now. Um, so I recently played against Casey C, who had this absolute gem of a deck list on the table. He was playing this rug natural order deck that just utterly obliterated me. I think it was on stream as well. Um, it's super cool. Yeah. So, um, let me say a couple of things here. Um, number one, I have a handful of things left in the queue from the pre Acoria world but I will be finishing all of those in the next week. So I have four pre Ikoria deck lists to do, and then we're getting into new stuff. So I will be looking for donation deck lists for the post Ikoria world. Uh, so hopefully some of this inspired you for things that you would like to see on the stream. So the four things that I have coming in the next week are a Last Rites discard deck, um, which I expect will be a very quick stream. We have Karn's Garage, which was a toolbox deck. Where are you? Uh, it was a Dak Faden, Karn the Great Creator, liquid metal coating deck. Um, that's a Sphinx of the Steel Wind and an Inkwell Leviathan hiding over there, by the way. Um, <laughs> so that should be interesting. Uh, we have another mono black deck, uh, which is going to see some play. Uh, 2020 updated version of the Gate, uh, where we just play some good old fashioned black magic cards and uh, and we see how we do. And then we have another Titanic Dryad stream. Um, this time around, we're going to try the blue splash for Uro and see how that feels. Uh, but once I get through those four, I'm going to be like going to go and like working with the new Ikoria cards. So yeah, um, that's what I have for you all today. Does anyone have any questions? I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes. I was expecting this to go until about 11 and we're still a touch early. So chat if you have any questions, any other deck lists that you want to showcase, this is the time. How was my day? Well, I woke up and I started talking about Legacy, so great. Hey, I donated for the gate. Can I change the deck instead to a new companion deck? Uh, yes. Um, I do nothing a lot. Will you just email me and we can get that into the stream ASAP? How incredibly dead is D&T, and will you change your name from Thraven University to the Petting Zoo? So which animals are we petting? So we get, like, a fox, we get a wolf. Like, are we petting the demon? Unclear how pettable Gyruda is. Let's take a look at the art again. Hmm, all right, let's get this center screen. I don't know. I don't know how fun this would be to pet. It looks slimy and or spiky. Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting one. Has Corona helped your stream numbers now that most people can't play at an LGS? Um, some of my numbers are trending upwards, but they were already trending upwards prior to coronavirus hitting. So, I, I can't tell whether it's just a continuation of my upward growth or if it is like specifically attributable to more people staying at home. Um, hard to tell. 
Oh, that's a good one. From one teacher to another, how do you deal with the current situation? Um, it's hard. The biggest piece of advice I have for you is to take a deep breath and accept that things have to be different. You're not going to get through as much as you normally get through in a year. You're not going to have the same degree of connections that you do with the kids uh, from the distant, the distance environment. You're not going to be able to do a lot of the cool things that you did previously. You kind of have to just like accept that things are different and do the best that you can and stop trying to do everything like you did in a normal classroom. And I'm doing as many things as I can to make it easy as possible for the kids to do things on their own schedules. Phil, can you tell us briefly about malo, 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 malo? All right, so in English, there's this phrase that uses the word buffalo repeatedly using all sorts of different meanings. So it's just like buffalo, 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 buffalo. And it refers to a whole bunch of very fringe meanings of the word buffalo other than it just being an animal. And similarly, in Latin, the word malo can mean uh, like a bully, an elderberry tree, to prefer uh, a bully, and there's like a whole bunch of other meanings. So you can string together the word mal malo like six times and technically have a grammatically correct sentence. You think it's a good idea to open up the economy? In this pandemic? <laughs> there, there's my sound clip for you. Yeah, um, so if you Google, like, buffalo three or four times in a row, you'll, you'll probably find the sentence. And similarly, if you Google malo a couple times in a row, you'll probably come across that sentence as well. Yeah, I think everyone should uh, be doing things to keep themselves safe and healthy right now. Most of my viewers are probably not in the most at-risk demographic, but many of your uh, your family members are, and exponential growth uh, is very much scary uh, with the coronavirus or antivirus. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Uh, what about Red Prison and Ikoria? Um, this is going to sound kind of crazy to say, but I don't think Blood Moon is a reasonable magic card to be playing right now, in, in many ways. So the three mana card that doesn't necessarily stop a lot of the commander, oh, sorry, companion shenanigans from occurring is maybe where, not where you want to be. Um, I haven't played any Red Prison since the deck came out. Um, I've been experimenting with Suppression Field, Stompy decks instead. But I can just see like turn one Blood Moon not being good enough and your opponent just like comboing off anyway. Uh, notably, it will make Gyruda kind of hard to cast, because in, like, the various Gyruda shells, it's, like, hard to get your blue and black. Your Colorless is pretty easy off the Ancient Tomb, City of Traders, and Monoliths, but your blue and black are hard, so maybe, like, that stops Gyruda from being cast. But if you're playing against the Zerda decks instead, like, say they're a white-based Zerda deck like this one, and you Blood Moon them, now you're just turning Zerda into a red card that they have to cast by tapping two random lands. Uh, I do nothing a lot. So the way the companion works is before the game begins, you reveal one card to be your companion. So could you have multiple companions in your sideboard? Yes, but you only get to use one in any specific game. I love it when my creatures get swords off Snow Forest. Yeah! Um... So there's another card that I didn't talk about, uh, Keenan, which allows Astrolabes to make double mana, but I have not seen a single Keenan cast against me in something like five leagues, maybe six leagues, since uh, Ikoria became legal. Uh, so not really expecting that card to have multiple. Yes, you only get to reveal one companion at the beginning of the game. Although, in between games, you can change which companion you reveal, if that's something that you are able to do. 
Another cool trick that we brought up on the Eternal Glory podcast is that if you happen to fit the casting requirements of a companion and you just want to give up a sideboard slot, you can reveal a companion at the beginning of the game in order to like juke your opponent about what you might be on. So like, let's say you never really want to cast a Lurus, but you have the ability to like put it in your sideboard. You can just use one sideboard slot to have your opponent be thinking about and fearing that Lurus the entire game. Uh, yes. Yes. Oko is now not the scariest thing in the format anymore. Not even close. So, the the way my leagues trended is, I don't know, what was it? Like, Thursday night, I think, was when Ikoria stuff, like, technically was available, what but, like, wasn't actually around. It was either Wednesday or Thursday night. And, like, that night, there was just Oko everywhere. And then all of a sudden, the new cards were actually available and people could find them. And then the Oko numbers just went and tanked. So, like, Oko stuff's still around, but playing around with the Zerda, Gyruda, and Lurus decks um, is just tending to be more popular right now. Whether or not that's going to be better in the long term is a totally different thing. But right now, we're definitely in the phase of experiment with the new broken cards rather than lean on the strength of the Uro and Oko shell that we know is generically good. I think it'll take between one and two weeks for us to get a better picture. Um, but as a whole, I would definitely expect Oko's numbers to drop for the first time when we get to the Legacy Challenge this weekend. So, like, Oko and Uro numbers have just been like, woo! Long time no speak, buddy. What's your bet on over under 2.5 companions get banned across competitive formats? Over. Absolutely over. Absolutely. I would, uh, I would not be surprised if multiple of these companions end up being too strong for their respective formats. Um, I'm really curious what they do in Vintage. So, like, in Vintage, you get, like, Black Lotus. You use Black Lotus to cast my companion. And if your companion is Lurus, then you Black Lotus again. So that's fair, right? Like, Black Lotus, get a free card, rebuy Black Lotus, do another degenerate thing. And they can't ban cards in Vintage. They just restrict them. Oh, no, I restricted your companion. Fuck. <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what they do with companions in Vintage if, like, they end up being broken there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how Vintage shakes out. I'm not going to put a lot of, like, mental energy into figuring that out. Like, I'll leave that to somebody else. But, like, Vintage is scary moving forward. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't want to start ban talks in, in Legacy now because like it is one hundred percent too early to be discussing those cards. Like people are just learning like how to put these cards together into broken shells, and people haven't started fighting against them. Uh, so this is something I said earlier and I posted on Twitter. But my pick for one of the best sideboard cards in the format right now is Null Rod and the Null Rod like cards. Null Rod, Stony Silence, and Collector Oof are amazing. They are great against the Zerda decks, they are great against the Gyruda decks, and they also have splash damage against some of the Lurus decks. Uh, so I didn't put any Lurus Storm decks up on stream. Um, Vivaris on the EpicStorm.com wrote a wonderful article about how good Lurus is in TES. So, I would go there if you want to just, like, see how Lurus is influencing TES. Uh, initial numbers are very impressive. Uh, but, yeah, once again, like previous sets, we have another set full of extremely powerful and pushed Legacy cards. And uh, we're definitely seeing the power level of formats trend upwards. And... It is becoming harder to fight the fair fight if you are not getting some of these new cards.
Um, so like beating the dead horse, Death and Taxes, for example, isn't getting a lot of new toys. And like it's missed out on a lot of the, the 2019, 2020 power level creep. And Aether Vile Go is not seeming like a good play anymore. Uh, it's super sad to say because like I love taxes, but it's it's rough. Like you go Aether Vile Go, they go Ancient Tomb, Grim Monolith, Lotus Petal, Karn, and you're just like, God, why? Um, I imagine many other fair decks are going to experience similar things. So, like, I wonder how things like goblins are going to fare. Dude, the Gyruda deck is legit good. It's very scary. I've played against it a lot, and, like, if I see my opponent is playing Garuda, I mulligan very aggressively to make sure that I have a relevant turn one play. Like, Garuda's scary. And, like, some of the Gyruda decks also play Cavern of Souls. Um, I think this one had Cavern. Yeah. So, like, some of the Gyruda decks play Cavern of Souls so that, like, all they have to do is get to six mana, and then you're very much fearful that you are going to die. Like, through Force of Will, Force of Negation. Yeah, so this this is... Sorry, let me scooch this over. This is the, the full deck list for the Gyruda Stompy that has Cavern of Souls. Yeah, the, the Zerta decks are very strong. So, like, the three companions that should be on your mind for the metagame moving forward are Gyruda, Lurus, and Zerta. And you should have plans to deal with all three. Uh, very, very much. Sorry, let me rephrase. I've been playing a lot of leagues. And I run into probably two of those three in any one given league. And the Yorian deck list. Yeah, I can pull that up again. Is Misty Engineer? Yeah, no, alright, so I need to do that size so you can screenshot it. So let, let me say that, like, despite the fact that we have a lot of new broken things, I am super enjoying the current format. Like, I am having so much fun jamming leagues. I am absolutely having more fun than I was playing against Oko Uromush every round. And, like, the new cards are most assuredly strong. But as of right now, it feels like things are fightable. Uh, so, like, definitely not advocating for banning anything at this time or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I... I have changed my deck lists to fight against the current format. I don't think you can just keep jamming the same thing that you were jamming a week ago and expect to do well. Like, you do need to specifically be playing cards for Gyruda, Zyrda, and Lurus. And, like, if you are just keeping your deck list from a week ago and, like, jamming it on Moto, like, that seems super questionable to me. <laughs> this sounds weird, but as long as Oko is trash, I'm fine with Legacy. Yeah, it is a... It is a high power format. Uh, no, I'm not currently running Dranith Magistrate. Um, something that I said earlier in the stream is that I might have to eat crow. Like, I call that card, like, unplayable fucking garbage three days ago. And then I spent six leagues playing against companions every round. And then I went like, oh, I get why this card exists now. Like, discounting companions, the card seems very bad. But companions are everywhere. Everywhere. So having a turn one play that, like, stops your Gyruda opponent from putting in their win condition means that their deck essentially does nothing, right? So if your opponent can't cast 
their sideboard Garuda, then they really only have three cards that are super relevant, and otherwise they have to like try to win the game by cloning your stuff. And their clones are way more expensive than your original copies. Um, that being said, the number of turn one and turn two kills or effective kills in Legacy has drastically increased in the past 48 hours. So, you can say what you will about that being healthy or not. So, like, for example, Aether Vow Go is bad, but Chrome Mox or Lotus Petal into Hate Piece is pretty good. Like, the, the ability to just play a turn one Haymaker that shuts off an angle of attack that your opponent is doing is really strong. So, for example, I'm playing with Suppression Field, and when you get paired against Zerda, and you mulligan to Suppression Field, and you just go turn one Suppression Field, go, and they go, shit, every card in my deck has an activated ability. It's way harder for me to win now. Or similarly, if you're playing against Gyruda, and you go turn one Null Rod off your Ancient Tomb, then it's really hard for them to make blue blue or black black. So they have usually eight-ish mana producing lands, and like if they have if they draw a Cavern of Souls, they have to like do another one. I haven't actually seen any deck list playing Surprise and Scary. If you are playing that. The, the, the depletion counter land, then you only need to hit this one land, but I have not seen a single one of these in any of my Magic Online games yet. So I don't think people most people are playing it. I'm seeing more like Underground Seas and Fetch Lands in those flex slots. So... Like, shutting off the artifact mana means it's actually very hard to cast these. Yeah, that is that is correct. That is a legit Mercadian Masks block uh, depletion counter land. Uh, yeah, Chalice of the Void is also very good. So Chalice of the Void on zero is becoming a better play in the blind against a lot of decks. So when you look at these Garuda decks, you're shutting off 12 of their cards when leading on 0. Or if you're looking at the Zerda decks, it shuts off 8 in this one. Um, where's a Bomberman list? Or it's shutting off 15 in this list. So a lot of times, it is like totally legit to lead on Chalice on 0 once your opponent has revealed Garuda or Zerda as a companion. And that's something I don't think a lot of people have realized yet, because I'm jamming more chalices than people. So, like, when I open on an opener that looks something like a uh, land, chrome mox, chalice on zero, followed up by, like, Thalia or Suppression Field or something like that, um, that gets a lot of wins. Uh, I think the Bomberman version is better. I think Bomberman's very good. Very, very good. Like, Bomberman was already probably a not quite tier 1 choice, but like a good tier 2, like, meta call. And now Bomberman might just be a tier 1 deck. Uh, there's a billion lists from today. There is no uh, one list programmed in for today. Yeah, I, uh... When some of these new cards went live... Um, in the stores, people were, uh, I think it was Brian Cook, who was sending me messages about how he got, like, Japanese foils of a lot of these cards before they're going to spike. Uh, some of these cards are going to be very expensive, like, foreign foils. Um, okay, so let's look at the text of Gyruda for a second. So, um, Gyruda ETBs, and it puts a creature card with an even converted mana cost from among these cards onto the battlefield under your control. 
Uh, so uh, rest in peace is not going to stop Guy Ruda. Uh, let's see, Cage does? Let's see, put a creature. Yeah, I believe Cage does, whereas Rest in Peace does not. Uh, let me con confirm by looking at the wording of Cage. Oh wait, I just own that card, I think. I don't own Graft Digger's Cage. Thanks, card hoarder. We're supporting all of my string shenanigans. Yeah, okay, a creature card can't enter the battlefield from graveyards or libraries. Um, so it would be placed into the graveyard, and yes, uh, Grafter's Cage would stop Gyruda. Uh, so the problem with Gyruda is that Gyruda does not care about what zone the cards are in. It just cares that the card was among the four cards that you put into the graveyard. It doesn't care if they end up in exile afterwards. It just cares that it was a card from that set. I got it. Alright, um, I think that's everything that I want to say here. I hope you all found this stream useful. Um, this will be up in YouTube in, I don't know, probably three or four hours between the uploading and processing time. So if you want to reference any of the deck lists from today, um, they will all be available there. Um, Unfortunately, I don't actually have text deck lists of most of these decks, uh, like as I just pulled them from screenshots from Twitter. So the best places, again, to get some of these deck lists, I got a lot of them from PVDH's Twitter. I got a handful of them from this. A uh, series of two articles by Joseph Dyer on MTG Goldfish. Those were really useful as well. Uh, I pulled the Grixis Delver deck list from the one that I liked uh, from Gold Ducat's Twitter, Daniel Gottschall's tw Twitter. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what I have for you for now. Yeah, I, I think I saw either a, like a Twitter status or a Facebook stream where you're talking about your results. Uh, well done. Uh, that is a very, very impressive record. All right, I think it is lunchtime for me. Uh, folks, I hope you enjoyed. If you do, please follow the stream. Uh, look at the stream legacy three or four times a week now. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn you over to my good friend Romario, who is probably playing legacy of some nature. Have a great rest of the day, folks. Uh, Lynn Chalice was putting up some good results. I know they did something else recently. All right, uh, just to answer that question real quick. Uh, Dragonlord Culligan is kind of like the backup plan, where you just give all your creatures haste and then you swing out with them in case you, you don't like fully combo off. Alright, uh, Slash Raid, Romario did all. Have a great rest of the day, folks, and if you aren't already following, consider following or doing something else to support my channel. Cheers! <laughs>